Well, this morning we are continuing with our series on what makes a church. And uh, we are picking up on a new part of that as we hear our scripture reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 to 18. Let's hear God's word together now from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us uh, pray together. Our God and Father, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for those who have served you throughout time, and for those prophets and apostles who shared their word, and whose words were written down as a a true and faithful revelation of your will and your nature and your calling on our lives. And so, God, now as we've heard the scriptures read, as we reflect upon them, Lord, speak to our hearts. Open our hearts wide to receive your word. And now I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it's been said we are meant to be in the world, but not of the world. Anyone ever heard that statement before? I think a few of us have. You know, the idea is that we are human beings, we exist in this world, but as Christians, we are supposed to be different somehow, and separate and distinct somehow. But that brings up an important question in how separated from the world we should be. Because, of course, you've got all sorts of different perspectives on that. Some believe that our separation from the world, well, we shouldn't be separated at all, some might say. Others, on the other hand, would say that Christians should be completely separate from the world and living in their own separate communes. Right? You can imagine the, the distinction that we have. Many churches are so aligned with the surrounding culture that there's really no distinction between the church and the culture itself. Everything Christian is simply reshaped to conform to the culture, and that has happened, as we know, to many churches across Canada and in the world. But then there are churches that hide away from the world and withdraw. Probably the most obvious example would come from the Anabaptist tradition, such as, you know, the old armor, old order, order Amish or or Mennonites. They really stand out because they've been so separated from the world that they don't use a lot of the modern conveniences like like, uh, our technology or electricity. They will ride their horse and buggies instead of driving cars in very distinctive clothing. So different because they live in their own separate communities. On our summer holiday we took our kids to the United States and we came through Pennsylvania and we stayed a couple of nights there and as many of you might know as we went through a place called Lancaster County this is true Amish country and before we went through we explained to the the children how we're going through this area where a lot of people live a different way they really do keep to themselves some of them but they definitely live a different way based on the technology they have we talked about the amish and the mennonites and so on and sure enough as we went through they were really there 
We would drive through town and on the streets you'd see a horse and buggy riding through. And often they would be riding bicycles instead of cars. But everyone seemed to have a different gradient of how much technology or, or how much uh, colored clothing they, they could wear or what styles they would show. It was really interesting though because you could still tell how different they were. But as we stayed at the Airbnb, we saw a woman across the road wearing a long dress and a bonnet, mowing the lawn. And she was mowing the lawn, though, with this really giant lawnmower. It must have been four times the size of a regular lawnmower. I'm, I'm assuming it has some self-propulsion going on. It seems to be bigger than any lawnmower I've ever used. And it was a woman pushing it. And so when we saw this woman across the road, my son asked me, Daddy, is she a Midianite? <laughs> Now, as you know, maybe Midianites aren't the quite same thing as Mennonites, right? But he said, Daddy, is she a Midianite? She's using a lot of electricity. Well, it was actually a gas-powered mower, but it certainly was technologically uh, functional. The thing is, where do we connect with others? Where do we separate ourselves in this world? How do we live in the world but not of the world? Do we go to the extremes of saying, well... We'll just blend in as much as we can as Christians and try to hide our Christian identity and maybe even compromise it at every turn? Or do we go to another extreme and say, well, let's not speak to anyone who does not belong to our special group. You can see both extremes, and of course there's much room in the middle. But we'll come to that a little later as we continue our series today in what makes a church. What really makes a church? Well, well, last time, in Acts chapter 2, we saw three main things. We saw these big three. The teaching, which was apostolic, the gospel of Christ, right? It's Christ being the fulfillment of the Old Testament. We saw the, the sacraments, marked by the breaking of bread. And we also saw of worship, marked by prayer and praise. These are what many people through history have considered essentials to the church. So you're not even talking about a church until you've got those components there. Now, through history, there have been different views on what's really essential to have a church. But these three have been widely considered to be the bare minimum for a church. Those things of the teaching and the breaking of bread and prayers, which would represent worship together. As the Westminster Confession of Faith said, the church is more or less pure according to the doctrine of the gospel that's taught and embraced, the ordinances that are administered, and the public worship performed more or less purely in them. So those three things of the word, the sacraments, and the worship. So if that's the case, and you're missing one of those three pieces, you don't quite have a church. So if you're trying to be a church and you're missing worship, that's a problem. If you don't follow the sacraments of Christ, that's a problem. If you don't teach the teaching of the apostles, that's a problem. However, even if you have these essentials and you have this very solid foundation, there are other important things that every church, church should have to make it what God wants it to be. We wouldn't just say, well, I've got the essence of a church, but... That's it. There are more things that go into making a church, even once you've got a really solid foundation. And you know, one of those very special things is also found in these verses from Acts chapter 2. If, you were, if I were to ask you what's missing there from verse 42 up there where the dots are, what would that word be? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Good guess, though. They do have prayer in there a little later, but they are committing themselves to the fellowship. It says, in fact, if you complete the sense, they devoted themselves, devoted themselves to the fellowship. That's the model of the early church. This is a glimpse of what the early church was like right from the get-go, right after Pentecost. And when you think about it, what is the church without fellowship? What's a church without fellowship. Fellowship's so important that some might even include it as one of the essentials that make a church a church. In fact, sometimes we even use the word fellowship as another word for church or congregation. You could say, I belong to that church, or I belong to that fellowship. 
So fellowship can refer to the group of people themselves who make up a church. But it can also mean more than that. You see, in the Bible, the Greek word is koinonia. I don't know if I had it in there, but it's basically, it carries this meaning of participation, partnership, sharing, communion. It can be translated all of these different ways. It's even used as a label for the Lord's Supper, because Paul says that in the bread and in the cup, we share in a partnership or in a koinonia in the body and blood of Christ. So you can see, though, no matter how uh, it's translated, it's always referring to something interpersonal, something relational. And you can see how important a word it is in the Bible. Impress your friends with your Greek this week. It's called koinonia. Okay? So, here we ask that question, what makes a church? And today, as we continue that series, we're focusing on fellowship or Greek koinonia. So here's the question though. Where do we find our fellowship? Where do we find our fellowship? In life we meet all sorts of people, we make connections and run into people and, and in time we tend to end up landing in a social circle. If you can think back maybe to your first day of high school you might think oh I don't know a lot of people but over time you make a few friends and friends kind of clump together and you, you get a bit of a social circle, right? You might have a group of friends here or a group of friends there, but you end up making these connections. But here's the thing, not all social circles are good. If you might remember that too, there might some be some kind of groups of people that you know are going to be a little more trouble and you might try to steal, steer clear of those. You might say there are others that are pretty safe and friendly too. Now, you might connect with people, for example, today. Maybe you'd say, all right, I've got a common interest. And you, you go and play pickleball, and you have a bunch of friends who play pickleball. Or maybe you'll buy a motorcycle, and the next thing you know, you're in a motorcycle gang. There, you know, these are pretty extreme differences, but you, you see how your social connections really do matter. You know, it's your fellowship. Your fellowship matters. You may have some influence in your social circle, but in the end, you're going to do what your group does because they're the ones who are going to call you up and say, hey, do you want to come and do this? Do you want to come and do that? And you're, you can only say no so many times before they stop calling you. So those people are going to have an influence on you, even if you do have an influence on them. You're going to get invited to those things. Do things together. The group that influences you the most is your fellowship. Where do you go to share life and partner with others in common life goals? Where are you really devoting yourself to others? That's your fellowship. That's your fellowship. That's your koinonia. So I'm asking you, where do you find your fellowship? Or maybe the better question is, where do you want to find your fellowship as a believer in Christ? Where do you want to find your fellowship? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about that. It tells us where to go and where not to go for that, because there are two sides, and a major part of finding good fellowship is, in fact, avoiding bad fellowship. And this is what Paul says in the book of 2 Corinthians. A lot of this chapter and this passage is about avoiding the bad fellowship, as we'll see. But... Uh, he does start out more on the positive side when he talks about connecting with him. He says, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our mouths are open to you, in some translations. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. So there may be the Corinthians are holding back from Paul and his friends and his community of faith and his teaching and his apostolic connection. But he says this, in return, I speak as to children, widen your heart, hearts also. In other words, I think he's saying, invite yourself open to us. Let's build and deepen our connection with each other. That's how it sounds to me like Paul wants uh, the relationship with the Corinthian church to go. Open up to us. But of course, there's the other side. And that is, where are they open? Where are they connected? Where are they finding their fellowship? 
who are they partnering with in Corinth? And so Paul brings up that big point and he says this. He says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Well, the implication, of course, would be that they probably have been yoked together with unbelievers and he's telling them not to do that anymore. Now, this is an interesting image, an interesting metaphor, isn't it? Being yoked together. And you might wonder, well, what is a yoke? And it's certainly, we're not talking about eggs or breakfast here. It's a different kind of yoke, right? The kind of yoke, which is like a wooden device that goes over the shoulders of a couple of beasts of burdens, burden that connects them together so that they could work together. To, yoke, to be yoked really just means to be joined together. So maybe these animals would plow a field or pull a wagon, maybe a heavier wagon, and they could carry more weight. If you have two animals, it lightens the load for each one. And so you can do more work. They can work harder. But what happens if one animal is bigger or stronger or faster than the other? Well, then the slower one's certainly going to hold the faster one back. Or if the bigger animal presses ahead and just goes ahead anyway, they'll travel at different speeds, and then, of course, they'll just go in circles. And I don't know how many farmers like crop circles, but that's what they might get if they're unequally yoked. You know, it's cause I imagine it would be like driving a car when your alignment is off. You know, have you ever done that? You have to keep correcting. Now, don't go on a long trip if that's your alignment, okay? Your arms will get very tired. But that's being unequally yoked. And you could even un unequally yoke two different kinds of animals that are doing their own thing, like perhaps an ox and a donkey, for example. Now, this is what Paul's advising against. Don't be unequally yoked. Don't link yourself up to people uh, with other beliefs who are going to take you in the wrong direction. Don't have that kind of fellowship. Now sometimes you may be able to steer someone in a better direction after you've been yoked to them, and, and that's true. Just think of you know, someone near to you who's kind of steered you in a good direction. Maybe that's happened as well. But even if you're going to do that, it's better to do that before you yoke yourselves to them. Because you don't know what circles you're going to end up running in along the way. And I know a lot of people link this principle to marriage. And that would be a fair application. It's good to marry a fellow believer. But I think Paul here is giving a more general meaning. That it's just not good to get your commitments, your fellowship to people who are not believers. Just think about who you're getting yoked up with. Are you an ox? Rethink linking up with that donkey over there. Okay? Or if you're a donkey, <laughs> rethink the ox. No one's thinking that's ever happened to them, right? Okay. But here's the thing. You want to be equally yoked. Believers with believers. Those commitments, that fellowship you have, that influence that people have on you, that guidance in your life, you want those to be the right people. People who are going to actually be pulling you in the right direction as you say, yeah, that is the right direction to go. Let's go together. Now what's interesting is that this uh, model, actually of the, the donkey and the ox, is one that shows up in a, a law of the Old Testament under the Mosaic Covenant for the people of Israel. Maybe you're familiar with uh, this in Deuteronomy 22, 9 to 11. You shall not sow your, your vineyard with two kinds of seed. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. And you shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. That's where the, you find that commandment in the, those interesting rules of not having these, these little mixes uh, together. These are some of those laws that we don't easily understand. However, one good explanation is that these laws served as a lesson for the people of ancient Israel. You see, if you have to keep these small, smaller matters, these smaller things separate, Think of how much more important it is to keep the big things separate. Don't mix and mess up your worship or your holiness. Keep things pure. Keep things sacred. 
And certainly Paul is applying this idea to the bigger principle of where you find your fellowship. Yes, it's a metaphor here, but the point is don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So, in other words, just don't mix these things up. And this is what he says. He says, for what? Partnership has righteousness with lawlessness. Or what fellowship, koinonia, has light with darkness. What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? And he goes through, and that is really his concluding point, likely pointing to the problem there in Corinth, that they were so connected to the people of their culture that they even said, you know what, we'll go to the temple with you and worship the idols. Why not? It's what everybody does, so we'll go too. And Paul's saying, enough. That's not where your fellowship is. You've got to cut that off. You can't just stay so connected socially to people that you do everything they do. You don't go to worship idols. But all of these things are meaningful. All these things, rhetorically asked, what do these things have together? And the answer is nothing. What does partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Nothing. What fellowship has light with darkness? Have you ever mixed light with darkness? Yeah, you can't have both at the exact same time. Light and darkness are not the same. That's his point. What accord has Christ with Belial? Now, Belial is an Old Testament Hebrew word. It shows up from time to time. It means worthless, as in the worthless sons of Eli in 1 Samuel 2.12. But here it's used like a proper noun, likely referring to Satan. What accord, what agreement does Christ have with the devil? You know, how do you mix these two together? You can't. What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? And that's what he's saying is don't be unequally yoked. Don't get your fellowship from people who believe the opposite of you. It's, you might as well try to mix all of these other things together. They just don't go together. The Corinthian problem was likely that they were just so connected to the people in their neighborhoods, their culture, that they were even going to join in idolatry. And maybe they could say, you know what, these are just statues. It's all trivial and who cares? And there may have been some truth to that, but they were still participating in the wrong aspects of the culture. They had their fellowship with the pagan culture of their time. That's where they were finding their accord, their partnership, their fellowship. And that was the wrong place to find it. Now, where do you find your fellowship? That's the question. Because you can certainly find fellowship and connection and allow people to influence you in certain areas that are going to be contrary to Christ. People will simply invite you to do whatever they do. As the Bible says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. 1 Corinthians 15.33. That was in Paul's other letter. Maybe this is a recurring problem if it's showing up in 1 and 2 Corinthians. But that is the, the challenge is that when we are yoked to people, we are partnered with people, we have that fellowship with people, it is so easy for us to get pulled in to do something we wouldn't have chosen to do. And we know we don't want to do, and we know it's not the right thing to do. And it's so easy for all of us as individuals to do that, and even for, for groups of people like churches to do that. It's like that old saying, if everyone jumped off a bridge, would you? I'll tell you, it was, I think just even this past week, we asked our son that question. The son, of course, who always has an answer. We said if everyone, he wanted to do something everybody else was doing and he was just following along and we asked him, if everyone jumped off a bridge, would you? And he quickly replied, yes. <laughs> because he's trying to be so quick, he probably responded too quickly to actually think about what he had said. 
And then we ask him, oh really? You jump off a bridge. And he said, yes. I'd go find a smaller bridge and jump off that. <laughs> Always has an answer. But that's just it. Sometimes we want to go with the crowd. Do what everyone does. But we also think, well, I don't really want to do that, but I pulled in that direction. And so we do things that we know we shouldn't do, things that we don't even in our heart want to do. Because we are linked up and we have this koinonia fellowship with the wrong crowd. And so that's that question. Where do you find your fellowship? Who are the people you partner with and, and you let influence you and, and you actually want to have influence you? Think of the people you look, look up to and you say, I want to be more like that person. And who are those people? If you are a believer, those people are believers. Doesn't mean they're perfect. But they're not going to steer you astray. Those believers, that's your fellowship. You know, the big idea here is that we don't find our fellowship in the world. We want to be separate from the world in some way. In the world, but not of the world. We've got a distinction. So my point here is not that you have to hide away from the world entirely. It's not that you have totally cut yourself off from the world and join a commune or something. It's that you don't find your fellowship in the world. You find it among the believers. You find it in the church. You go to church and you find it there. And you know, Paul points out this balance in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says this. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. So in terms of the world having people like that, of course, that's true. But that word, as Paul is saying here, you cannot associate with the immoral people who are really claiming to be Christians. But in terms of the world, you can associate with those people to some degree. The Greek word for associate, though, is not koinonia. You have some interaction with sinners all the time. Otherwise, you would have to float off the face of the earth and, and not connect with anybody. That's what Paul's saying. But that's not possible. What he's saying, though, is that you, shouldn't, you, you could associate with them, the immoral people of the world, but note that the Greek word for associate is not koinonia. It's sunana mignumi, and that's a pretty long word, so you don't have to remember that one. Okay, But it's different. The question is, where do you get your koinonia? And you get that from the believers. You don't get that from the world. You can socialize and have friends and so on, but you don't yoke yourself to those who are going to lead you in non or even anti-Christian directions. And so there's a balance there. You can still deal with sinful human beings, but your fellowship is with Christ and his people. And this is really what Paul's encouraging us to be and to do. He says this, For we are the temple of the living God. In other words, there's no fellowship with the temple and idols. There's no agreement there. And we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. We are God's temple because God dwells within us. By the Holy Spirit, He dwells in us. We are His temple. And He says, Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Don't be so bound to the sinful things of the world. Sever those commitments, those partnerships, that koinonia with the wrong crowd and the wrong thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So should we go and try to go into this world and join with everything impure or wrong? Absolutely not. Be, be separate from those, but be joined 
to God. Be joined to his people. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me. And this is the profound thing, that this is one of those things that Christ does for us. He does save us by his sacrifice on the cross. He died for our sins. He saves us from the judgment of God. He also sanctifies us and makes us holy and separate and different. And he also adopts us as his sons and daughters. So we are now the children of God in Christ. When we trust in Jesus, he does all of these things. We are a new people. We are a family of faith. And we may know that to some extent, but the reality is that we can live that out by our connections to other believers. It's a reality. So here's the question, what makes a church? And the answer, well, one of those big things is fellowship. Fellowship. The Bible says they devoted themselves to the fellowship. And so find your fellowship with fellow believers. Deepen those relationships. I know it's sort of challenging, isn't it? Because there are people we see every day and we spend a lot of time with. Maybe we spend more time with than sitting with people for about an hour or two on a Sunday morning. And maybe those aren't always the most naturally developed, deepened relationships. But I would encourage everyone to be deliberate and intentional on that. Find those believers in your neighborhood, at your church, deepen those connections because that is where you want to be yoked. That's where you want that fellowship. A Christian friend makes a big difference in your life. Have you ever had a really good Christian friend encouraging you? Have you ever felt alone in your faith though? And that's so different. It's so hard. Deepen those connections. Again, I'm not saying never talk to someone who doesn't have perfect theology, okay? <laughs> you can have good, good social connections and friendships with people. But where you get your fellowship, where you let people work with you and partner with you in your life goals as a Christian, those need to be believers as his people. See, when we do this, we help people grow in their faith and stay on track. And they help guide you and keep you on track. And so you don't go in circles by being yoked in the wrong, with the unequally yoked, yoked improperly. And so what can we say we can do? Well, certainly enjoy the fellowship, connect with people, go to church. I'd say enjoy that, going to church and connecting with people. And that's why, although TV and online are great resources and great teaching methods, you can never replace the whole thing just by going online or reading some good books or watching the best preachers on TV or YouTube, as the case may be, whoever they are, wherever you find them. There's no substitute for the church. There's no substitute for fellowship and actually knowing real people. So even if you can't get around like you used to and you can't get in through the doors every Sunday morning, there's still people you can call on the phone. If you want to be extra old-fashioned, you can write a letter with a pen and paper, a quill pen even, if you want to be really old-fashioned, right? Or you can invite people to visit you. We can always build and deepen those connections, encourage someone, invite someone to our homes, ask them how they're doing, deepen those friendships and relationships with believers. And that really makes a church. Can you imagine a church where nobody knows anybody? Everybody comes in exactly when it starts. Everybody leaves exactly when it goes. You don't even have a conversation. You don't say hello. No greeter at the door. We have really good greeters at the door, right? But that's it. Building those connections. It's deepening. Building that fellowship. I'm just going to close off with Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It says this, and this is one of those things that people brought up during COVID, like, can we really just not have churches open at all? There's a problem, right? We can't be the church without getting together. And this is what some people noted. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, 
Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Isn't that where we come together? We want to encourage each other. Praise be to God for his greatness and his glory forever. Amen. God's blessing. May the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us all. Amen.